our workshop, where we um, will welcome you to the workshop. And um, our next speaker is Daniel Nufer, Nufer, can I pronounce anyone's names? And he will speak to us about two ontologies of the ethical in Patochka's Idealité et Historicité. Thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Um, in relation to the, especially in the first talk, um, we heard a lot about Patochka's, the relationship of the individual person to the political and the, the task that uh, faces them. And in this book, I think Patochka really gives a detailed description of the individual's moral struggle. Um, so hopefully this can sort of add to the, the understanding of how the individual is to uh, behave in post-Europe. And um, one conflict that Patochka identifies um, in the middle of the book, which he sees as running throughout the entirety, he says, of moral philosophy, um, is he relates it back to this conflict between eternity and uh, historicity. And um, <clears throat> he says that basically what happens in the modern situation, so in the 20th century, is that moral thought has split into two what he calls tendencies. Um, there are, on the one side, you have a type of moral thinking which aims at a scientific character. Um, in this conception, what's important is what's objective, durable, universal, what applies in all cases. And on the other side, uh, you get what he calls a you know, protestations in general quite romantic against this kind of pedantry. And what you see there is a, a divide which, I mean, he doesn't say that all thinkers are strictly on one side or the other, but that in all moral philosophy there tends to be a pull between these two tendencies with usually one or the other winning out. And the problem with the first, with this more scientific one, is that he says it lacks um, a moral depth. Um, it pays no attention to the struggle of the individual. And I think everyone has a copy of the quotes. You can see in the first quote, unfortunately, they're all in French. Uh, but what, what matters in this one is durable essences and everything, all of the emphasis is on the objective experience. Um, and it pays no attention to the, the private aspect of um, and then the problem with the other side, he thinks, is that it lacks a kind of a, a philosophical rigor on the other side, so that there's no, it, it tends to just dissolve into a kind of a relativism. Um, now, what, one of the aims that he has in the book is to show that this dichotomy is actually kind of a false problem, um, and that it, it's the result of a misunderstanding of the notion of essence. Um, and he says that the solution to this problem can come from what he calls a concept of historical essence. Um, so my aim in this talk of maybe about 20 minutes or so is to try to get at what he means by historical essence. Um, and I'm going to do this through his critique of Sartre and uh, existentialism. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, as an example of eternity, on the eternity side of the divide, he gives, for example, Kant, uh, where the focus is really on the law, on the moral law, and the actual individual's experience doesn't really get any attention. Um, an example of the more historical side of things um, could be someone like uh, Nietzsche, for example, where what you really focus on is the struggle, the kind of uh, the indecision and the impossibility of morality. Um, <clears throat> then he gets at this problem, first of all, by looking at the uh, what he calls an old metaphysical controversy, which is that between um, essence and existence. Um, and he says that, <clears throat> in general, what has happened in the history of philosophy is that essence has been defined as something transcendent, something... Uh, which is above existence. Um, and he thinks that 
either that kind of a conception has been affirmed in different ways or it's been rejected in favor of existence. And that leads him into uh, the uh, talking about uh, existentialism. And he gives, uh, in relation to this problem between essence and existence, uh, he asks a question which... Uh, no, that's it there. Uh, the question is basically, is there no determination of essence which is not pre-given? And is there no sense that we can think of an essence as not existing above and beyond, uh, but as actually being intimately related to temporality? And he says that this conception is the historical essence. Um, <clears throat> he moves on to then talk about existentialism, and from his definition of a historical essence, he says it's something which is, in some sense, dependent on our existence. Uh, you would, I, the first time I read it, for sure, naturally assumed he would go towards uh, a kind of a Sartrean conception saying something like, we have no predefined essence. But it's actually precisely there that he critiques uh, Sartre. So he says, uh, for example, that <clears throat> Sartre makes a mistake when he says that in human existence there is nothing durable. Uh, he says that the idea of historical essence necessarily presupposes something durable and fixed um, in human existence, which precedes existence. Um, and this is, sounds extremely contradictory. Um, and the way that he gets at that is, <clears throat> he, well, he says, for example, that when Sartre affirms that uh, human consciousness in human consciousness, existence precedes essence. What he actually means is that the constant structure of consciousness is actually negativity. But that does not mean that there is no essence. Um, and he says that there is a difference between uh, consciousness and its complete dissolution. And he thinks that if there were no pre-given structure, no essence to it, it would simply dissolve into nothing, so that there has to be something there. Um, now, he thinks that the misconception of essence which underlies this problem comes from uh, a misunderstanding of the Socratic question by Plato. We've heard from Joris already about this, uh, play, like what Potoczka thinks is uh, Plato's misunderstanding of the Socratic question. So the Socratic question basically is, what is the good? Um, now, <coughs> uh, Potoczka <coughs> thinks that when Socrates asked this question, uh, what he wanted to do was to create a movement of existence, but that when Plato gave a definitive answer to it, he actually neutralized that. So the second that the question gets a definitive answer, it loses its, its real framework, or its real power. Um, <clears throat> Now, in the Platonic conception of the essences or something transcendent, and what happens is that existence becomes merely inferior to the essence. Um, and he thinks that Sartre is actually correct to reject such a notion of essence. Um, but as Joris pointed out earlier, he makes this distinction between the Platonic answer to the Socratic question and other uh, answers which are possible. So he goes back to a type of a try to radicalize the Socratic question and to see what was really um, at stake in it. Um, so he says that basically Plato was just one Socratic among others. Uh, it's one possible way of looking at it. Uh, and the, the true sense of the Socratic question does not derive from its answer. It derives from the movement which it initiates, the movement of questioning. Um, <clears throat> so he says that when Socrates asks what is the good? Uh, he asks, what is the good, the human good, and it initiates the idea of uh, teleology, of a goal to life. Um, and he sees there are two movements in the Socratic question. Um, you've got the elenctic and the protraptic. So in the elenctic movement, uh, Socrates, or whoever asks it, uh, is able to reject the given. Uh, what we have is, uh, you know, any good in the Socratic method, you would talk to someone, what is the good? Someone gives an example, the good is happiness, but all of these goods prove to be inadequate 
uh, to the standard which is actually set by the question. Um, now, if the, if the movement <coughs> remains at that, then it remains in just complete negativity. But what needs to happen is the protracted movement. Um, and in this, uh, there is an attempt to solidify uh, life and to, <coughs> um, he thinks that it opens up, uh, it, it brings a task to the person so that you reject what is given, but a task is also put upon you to find some sort of meaning. And he says in, at one point that the Socratic question achieves what it seeks merely in the asking, not in the answer. So by allowing the person to reject the given, um, <coughs> the, uh, a new movement of human existence is opened. Um, <coughs> now, I says, for example, the, the Socratic question doesn't find its true meaning except in the asking. Um, now, this brings him back to um, <coughs> the historical essence. So when he comes back to Sartre, and you can see there's a provisional definition of historical essence. Um, <coughs> he says that the historical essence is not a positive content, um, entirely supertemporal or omnitemporal. On the contrary, it's a universal moment above time, of all time. Um, is this moment, a negative moment of insatisfaction, of absence in the given, so that it's first of all a rejection, but then what's important is it's a call to realization in time. So we need to actually, we don't just simply negate, but we are actually called upon to realize an essence. And he says somewhere later on that there has never been an essence which existed outside of time. It always has to be called into being. Um, <clears throat> now, the... <clears throat> so the, the first movement, um, I mean, the, the thing that un constantly comes into my head when I, I thought of this is, if you think about it in relation to Nietzsche, that if you just reject what's given, um, you know, you would think, is this some sort of life-denying thing? It's this positing of something transcendent, which in a way abdicates responsibility. But for Patochka, uh, abdicating responsibility, is, that's not what transcendence is about. Because when you reject what's given, you, you take an actual stand in relation to it. And then by positing some sort of higher meaning, you take the full responsibility for that positing. Um, and the fact that the question needs to be posed again and again means that there's an actual a momentum to things. It's not like, say from a Nietzschean conception, that there's a transcendent good is posited and then that's a sort of a, your whole responsibility is offloaded onto that. Rather, um, you take the responsibility for that good, but you're constantly open to it being renegotiated. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> When, um, when Patochka elaborates this notion of the historical essence, um, he thinks that he has managed to overcome this divide between uh, eternity and historicity. Um, because the essence has this double structure that it both allows you to reject what is historical, but also uh, cause, like, means that you have to undertake a task of positing something. Um, <clears throat> it, we no longer see an essence as something which has no relation to our lives, but rather you see that there's a struggle of existence between this positing and rejecting. Um, so, if you look... Um, and I think one quote from earlier on in the book, uh, there's a heading there, Tension, uh, explains it quite well. He's talking at the start of the book about Czech humanism and he says that what he sees in Czech humanism is a, around the, in the 20th century is a divide between a metaphysical type of humanism, so which could be a type of Christian humanism and a non-metaphysical one. Um, and he says that it's actually the, the metaphysical one which is 
less dogmatic, um, which is quite a surprising statement. And I think what he means by that, um, he says it's the other branch of our humanism which, without any established dogma, um, and as he goes on, it, at work here is a, a greater internal tension, more intensity of uh, weight on life which is heavier and more painful. And it's because in such a conception, uh, these humanists have not let go of the idea of some ultimate meaning. Whereas he says in the heretical essays that uh, nihilism just becomes purely dogmatic if it resolutely affirms that there is no ultimate meaning to life. Um, and I think that it's dogmatic in the same way that, for example, if you got a fundamentalist Christian who took you know, every single word in the Bible as ultimate truth um, and was unwilling to negotiate it, uh, both conceptions could be seen to be dogmatic in that they, they are unwilling to question their assumptions and they reduce to a form of paralysis. Whereas he sees in Christian humanists, say for example, the Aspers, that there's this unwillingness to let go of an ultimate meaning but a recognition of the fact that it needs to be constantly renegotiated and applied. So for in such a conception, this transcendent meaning doesn't, isn't an ultimate thing. It doesn't lead to any kind of stasis. It actually propels existence through a constant renegotiation. Um, and in some of his later works, he talks about these movements of existence, and this is like the, the third movement of existence. Um, now, <clears throat> It could seem, for example, um, there's another quote here, the grounding of morality in the movement of authentic existence, uh, where he says that <clears throat> he's talking about a, a Czech philosopher called Emmanuel Radl, and Radl thinks that by returning to Socrates, we can reground morality for the 20th century. Um, but the Socrates that he wants to return to is the Platonic Socrates with this transcendent world of ideas. Um, and Radl thinks that the whole, you know, that's what we need. We need to go back to the transcendent world of ideas, to a, an absolute form of morality to save us from 20th century dissolution. Whereas what Patochka thinks is that we should go back to Socrates, um, but back to this reconceptualization of it. Uh, where we see that what Socrates has actually uncovered in the Socratic method is the fundamental essence of human existence. Um, and he says that in this one, uh, there always rests the fundamental possibility that moral life could be founded in the historical essence of man um, as a, an exigence of care for the self, of uh, know yourself, the Socratic know thyself. Um, which is not a simple instinct, but is something which must be allowed to burst forth like uh, an ember um, under the surface of immediate life, um, and that we can thereby determine consciously human life. Uh, so that through this movement of existence, um, we can actually uh, regenerate an authentic form of life. Um, now, one thing that I immediately thought when I was kind of trying to work out this was that it's, it's extremely harsh. Um, it's a very harsh sort of command to put upon someone that everything has to be rejected. You know, you must go th constantly go through this process to live authentically. There must be a rejection and there must be this positing of something. But I think that if you look at Patochka's conception of creation, it actually explains how it, it's much more realistic in a way. Um, he says that every creation is nothing but a renewal. Um, that what creation is actually about is about going back to the, the fundamental sort of truth which was underlying uh, traditions or things like that. So he says um, in this one under creation, um, Meaning only creates itself in the fight against the pure and simple leveled off present. Um, in the, the combat for authentic life, which implies a moving beyond uh, what exists into a confrontation with being. Um, and every creator knows what is at stake in his creation is something ultimate, 
and we feel ourselves touched by the wing of death at our moments of uh, decision. Um, <clears throat> and I think to maybe put it in relation to Sartre a little bit, um, for Sartre, there is never really going to be true being. Because any time that we fully identify ourselves with something, uh, it's bad faith. Um, but for Patochka, true being is actually achievable. But it constantly falls away from us again. We need to keep renegotiating it. So for Patochka, true being is actually in the movement. There's no one system of rules or anything that you can follow which will lead to an authentic life. But it's rather this constant renegotiation. And I think that this conception um, led to the kind of plurality of, for example, Charter 77, where what you had was an idea of authentic existence, which wasn't just based on rationality. It allowed, for example, you know, Catholic priests, uh, Jesuits, ex-communist party members, people who've never been in it, to come together um, with a sort of an ideal of human existence, which was very pluralistic. It, it allows, I think, through his idea of creation, it allows the fact that you can, you can take up former ways of life and things like that, but it needs to be constantly renegotiated and put into a total meaning of your own life. Um, and I think if we look at um, the quote just under creation, he says the reaction of this being against um, objectivity, um, affected by this minus sign, so that we initially bring in this negation of what is, is in effect an essential affirmation. Um, so that we actually constantly reaffirm uh, what is given, but only after having rejected it. Um, now, if you look at the last quote, uh, it's this pretty much the end of the book. I think it's the last chapter of, one of the, or the last paragraph of one of the final chapters. He says, this is what he calls a genuinely historical et et ethics. Um, and he says, perhaps it is clear at present that what is possible from this point of view is an ethics which, without calling directly to uh, a higher world to a metaphysical transcendent world of ideas is nonetheless an ethic in the f an ethics in the full sense of the term, an ethics of commandments, of obligation, of self overcoming, of rigor and sacrifice. Uh, at the same time, on the other hand, of cre of free creation, inventivity, and inf infinite flexibility, um, an ethics which does not believe in forms and laws and imperatives al already made. Um, which lead to nothing but a uh, Pharisaic uh, auto-satisfaction, so just total self-satisfaction. It's an ethic of, ethics of risk and incertitude, um, but also of intimate necessity, uh, a truly historical ethics. Now, I think probably the first ten times I read that, I thought that's impossible. How can you unite these aspects into one perspective? Um, but I think when you look at it from what he's carved out as the historical essence, you can see how these aspects kind of unite. Um, <clears throat> for Patochka, authentic existence can't just be about any kind of transcendent laws there ha or complete free creation. For example, in the sense of the overman in Nietzsche, it can't just be this taking the full weight of morality upon yourself um, and having total responsibility. At one point he says that he agrees with Jaspers um, that man alone is not sufficient uh, to understand morality. You, you, there needs to be something beyond. But that beyond is the result of human responsibility. We need to posit that only to have it renegotiated. Um, so, that's basically what I wanted to get at, was this genuinely historical ethics. Um, there's a few questions that I have about it. Um, <clears throat> one criticism that came into my head, and I'm sure it would, a lot of people would instantly have this reaction, is that this gives us no guidance <laughs> to really, like, how can you form an ethics on the basis of this? But I think that's precisely not the point. 
The point is to describe what is at stake in moral existence. What is the essence of moral existence? It's this constant renegotiation between eternity and historicity, between something transcendent and something and the, our own subjective experience. So rather than provide a framework from which to uh, develop some really concrete ethical system, it provides a way of looking at existence which allows us to see what's actually operating within it. Um, now, I think a more poignant criticism is, is this hopelessly individual? Um, now, this, I think, is where it gets complicated. And he points this out at the end. He says it could, the charge could be levelled against uh, me at this point that this is incredibly individualistic, and he says it is. But he does say that there's a necessary interpersonal or political aspect to it, but in the typically Patochkin style, he says, but these few words will suffice, and doesn't quite develop it. Um, but I think if he wrote a letter to a friend after he wrote the book, and he said that when he started, he thought it had a really great momentum that this division between eternity and historicity and the idea of the historical essence really opened up the kind of problems of morality. And he said the book had a great momentum. But by the time he got to the end, he, he said he didn't feel it had anything. And he just put it in a wardrobe and left it there and didn't try to do anything with it. Um, and I think what's really interesting about this genuinely historical ethics is that what he missed here was the interpersonal aspect, the political thing. And to come back to what we were talking about earlier about the polis, um, I think that perhaps on an individual level, this is possible. This sort of really harsh, you know, attempt to live authentically where you, you know, filter everything through uh, the question of the good and try to constantly pose a transcendent meaning. But if you put it into the situation, for example, of the polis, where there is actually, we're actually being forced into something, um, there's a coercion in it that in acting in a community, if we ask the question, what is the good? It's not just the question of what is the good for me. It's the question of what is the good for us as a community. And in posing an answer to that question, uh, you are posing an answer which affects other people as you act intersubjectively. And I think that a community of criticism, which is the solidarity of the shaken, could be looked at as that in his later writings, actually answers a lot of the problems or the, the, he seems to run into at the end of the book. Um, and also in terms of so that's in relation to, to the protreptic element, this positing of something higher. But in relation to the Elenchus, um, I think that what the Elenchus actually involves is realizing the relativity of what is given. And by acting in relation to other people in a sort of a pluralistic environment, you do realize that. You see other forms of existence. Um, and your own form of existence is relativized. And in a sense, the good as something transcendent, I think, can act as a mediator between different uh, personal approaches to morality. And I think that that interpersonal element can potentially enrich and maybe save it from some of the problems that it runs into. Yeah. Thank you.